Hi, I'm Charlie Carlson, and I'm a native of Seminole County. Grew up in the community of Lake Monroe. I'm a historian and an author of several books about local history. You know, most folks don't realize that all of Central Florida's history actually began on the shores of Lake Monroe. And in the next few minutes, we're going to take a look at these little histories that we often take for granted, like the railroad history, the military history, the political history, and the entertainment history. And all of it began right here in Seminole County. Lake Monroe is probably the main reason why the human came to this area. Now the first people that came into this area were the Paleo Indians. That was 9,000 years ago, and this area looked much different than it does today. The flora and fauna was so different that you cannot even imagine it. For example, the lake itself was nothing but a pockmarked bunch of springs. The animal life were the extinct mammoth and the giant sloth and the prehistoric horse. And the people that followed these herds of extinct animals into this area were known as the Paleo Indians. So they were the first people to arrive in this area. Lake Monroe was also known first as Lake Valdez by the Spanish. It was always and has been a waterway from Jacksonville to the interior of Florida. In 1835, during the Second Seminole War, the military established a fortification called Camp Monroe on the banks of the lake. A large number of Seminoles attacked this fortification from two sides, led by Coacuchi, also known as Wildcat. And in this battle, which has become known as the Battle of Lake Monroe, Captain Charles Mellon was killed. They changed the name of Camp Monroe to Fort Mellon. Fort Mellon then became a logistical staging point for supplies going south as the Army pushed the Seminoles closer to the Everglades. Fort Mellon was not just a stockade fort, as many people think. It was one of the largest forts during the Seminole War, and it covered several of today's city blocks. There was a road, which still exists today, known as Mellonville Avenue, that was built by Zachary Taylor from Fort Mellon all the way down to Fort Brooke, which is today's Tampa. After the Seminole War, Fort Mellon grew into the town of Mellonville which used many of the military buildings that was left over from when the Army had occupied the area. You might think these are rocks, but actually these things go back 10,000 years ago. These are teeth from a mammoth elephant, now extinct. This one was found in the vicinity of the Interstate 4 Bridge back in the early 1950s by a man named Buck Hawkins. Buck Hawkins was a commercial fisherman, and he was digging fish bait where he landed his boat at, and uh, he, he dug up this thing that he thought was a dinosaur tooth. He had no idea that it was actually a mammoth elephant tooth. I mean, who would think about elephants being in Florida, but they were at one time. So he took it home, and for a generation, it was used as a doorstop until H. James Goot, who was a paleontologist from Sanford, identified it as a mammoth elephant tooth. This is the first known mammoth tooth to be found anywhere around Seminole County. <laughs> In 1870, Henry Sheldon Sanford came to this area, and he had caught the orange fever like so many people of that day who were making great profits in the citrus business. 
And he bought a large tract of land on Lake Monroe that extended all the way from the borderline with Mellonville westward to uh, about where the Interstate Highway 4 is at today. Henry Sanford began building a sawmill, a, a, uh, a hotel, and some other small stores, and he called it Sanford after, him, after his own self. Henry never spent much time in his town. He was always gone with his other interests someplace else. But people came to the area and they began buying land here and settling down. Sanford then imported several groups of Swedes to the area to work in his Bel Air groves, which were between Sanford and today's Lake Mary community. And these Swedes became some of the first ethnic people to settle in this area. By 1886, Sanford was going pretty good as a community. It was outgrowing its neighboring community of Mellonville, which was a separate community. And eventually, Mellonville merged into to, uh, Sanford. The area became an ideal place for citrus. There was citrus groves springing up everywhere, and it became a citrus growing center until the devastating freezes of 1895 and 1896, which virtually put most of the citrus groves out of business from this point up to Jacksonville. And after that, people did not know what they were going to do. They had the land, but the groves had been frozen, frozen down and the trees had been cut and removed. Well, they had a good fertile soil here along the St. Johns River Valley. We had muck lands in Oveda. We had a good hard pan here. We had artesian wells, free flowing water. And they began growing vegetables and they found out this was an ideal place for growing produce. So going into the early 1900s, Sanford was an agricultural center. And eventually by the, by the 1920s, Sanford had become the nation's celery growing capital. In the 1920s, we were shipping from Sanford somewhere around 7,000 to 8,000 boxcar loads of celery every year. If you went on the outskirts of Sanford back in those days, you would have seen miles and miles of celery fields. One reason that uh, Sanford and Seminole County in those days was a prime area for growing produce was the railroads. Sanford has quite a history with its railroad system. The South Florida Railroad was the first railroad to be built south of the St. Johns River. But in those days, in order to reach the point to where you boarded the train, you had to take a steamboat from Jacksonville down the St. Johns River to Sanford. There was many hotels built in Sanford for people to stay at while they waited to catch the, the train south. In 1886, the railroad bridge was built over the St. Johns River. And in a sense, that bridge kind of represented the golden spike for Florida because it tied together a continuous rail route from Jacksonville to Tampa. Now people did not have to travel by steamboat to Sanford to get on the train to go south. They could get on the train in Jacksonville and virtually go overnight to Tampa. So that railroad bridge meant a big thing for Florida. But because we had the railroads in this area, and Sanford was certainly a transportation center because not only did we have the railroads, we had the steamboats here too. And that's why all the big hotels sprang up in the area. The railroads, by the time that we got into agriculture, were such of a network that you could virtually ship agriculture almost anywhere, especially to the north. And because you're shipping agriculture, you have to have some fast way of moving it. So Sanford had the railroad system that was needed by the farmers to ship their products. Oh, 
Oh, this is a nice hat. This is typical of the hats that were worn by the early settlers uh, in Seminole County. It's actually woven from the fronds of the palmetto. And some people have referred to these as cracker hats because the early people that lived in the area were known as the, the crackers or Florida crackers because of uh, the fact that uh, when they would drive their cattle, they would use big bull whips and that would make a cracking sound. So they were known, became known as the crackers. So this is a cracker hat made from palmetto bushes. Now, along about the same period, we had the Seminole Indian, which is probably the most well-known Indian in Florida. And they made, the, they used uh, a very decorative, decorative way of making their shirts. And these, are, these shirts are made from uh, strips of cloth, which uh, was traded with the Seminoles from the white people. And they would sew these strips of cloth together to make a shirt. The Seminole women used little small uh, sewing machines. And if you are in the, uh, the region of the Everglades and some of the uh, Seminole reservations today, these are highly prized as a uh, souvenir item from there. One thing different with refrigeration in those days was that there wasn't any for boxcars. They had to load ice into the boxcars to keep the products refrigerated on their trip north. And in the 1920s, the Mountain City Ice Company of Chicago built a large ice plant in the Lake Monroe community west of Sanford. Actually, this uh, ice plant was so big that it was considered the second largest ice plant in production in the world. It furnished the large blocks of ice for the bunkers in the railroad cars that were going to haul the produce north. The remnants of that old ice plant still stand west of town. If you look for celery farms today in Seminole County, you won't find any. It's doubtful that you would even find a celery plant growing any place. And you may wonder, well, what happened to all of this great days of celery for Seminole County? Well, what happened was is that the economy changed. Mechanical farming changed, got better. Sanford's celery fields on the average was somewhere between about 10 acres and 17 acres, which was quite small in terms of farming. Down south around Pahokee and around Okeechobee, uh, you had large, vast mucklands there. And they invented a contraption that was called the mule train, which could crawl over vast acres of produce and harvest it. So celery gradually started moving south because they could grow a lot more of it there. You may remember me mentioning that uh, all history in Central Florida began on the shores of Lake Monroe. And that includes the entertainment history. Oh yeah, I mean today, you know, you, you think of Orlando as being the entertainment capital of, of Florida because of the theme parks. But actually Sanford was the entertainment center going back to the 1890s and the early 1900s. It was Sanford that had the, the opera houses and the theaters. It was Sanford where all the, the troops of entertainers came to. And people would come to Sanford from the outlying communities to, to, have, to enjoy the entertainment. And circuses. Today you don't see very many circuses anywhere in the country. But Back in those days, Sanford received some of the biggest circuses in the country. And I'm talking about circuses that, that had big tops that would sit as many as 10,000 people. And they would come in on rail cars. Sometimes th these circuses came on three different trains. And they would set up in various places in town. One of the places is where the Seminole County Administration building is at the corner of First Street 
in Mellonville. That became a, a major circus ground. And not only circuses, but Wild West shows. Uh, there were uh, other types of traveling shows that came into town. And what is interesting is that, that this meant so much, this entertainment, to, that people would actually uh, come to town and spend time in hotels so they could to, uh, attend these, these shows. The railroads were, off, were offering special excursion trains to, to the communities surrounding Sanford to bring people in. And in, in many cases, you could buy your, your train ticket and your circus ticket at the train station. So Sanford was indeed the entertainment capital at one time for Florida. This looks like an ordinary little uh, oak table. Actually, this table is over 100 years old. There's something curious about this table. It's called a spirit table. It once belonged to a medium. Her name was Maggie Bell. Maggie Bell lived in the community of Lake Monroe. She was the wife of John Bell, the most prominent celery grower in that area. Maggie was a, a seer, a medium, a psychic, and she would hold seances in her parlor on Friday nights. No one ever admitted to attending these seances, but actually everybody in the community showed up there on, on Friday night, and, and sometimes her parlor would only have standing room only. And during these sessions, it is said that she could uh, cause this table to, to, to levitate from the floor. And there were people who actually claimed to have seen this. The other thing Maggie could do is, is cause voices to come out of the walls of her parlor and rapping sounds to come out of this table right here. But this is an artifact of uh, Seminole County's paranormal side, whether you want to believe it or not. One of the big entertainment attractions in Sanford was a municipal zoo, which sat at the very end of uh, Park Avenue in the lakefront, where today's City Hall is located at. And the zoo actually began at the fire department on Palmetto Avenue when people would drop off stray raccoons or ducks or other types of animals and the, the kids would come by the fire department to see the, the animals there. Well, then after a while it got to be too much so they decided to, to do something with the animals and they acquired some land on the lakefront there and they, they built the Sanford Municipal Zoo. And eventually the, the zoo was shut down in Sanford and was moved out to, to where the uh, Central Florida Zoo is at today. Now, where the Central Florida Zoo is located at was preceded by another attraction that was in the early 1900s. It was known as Woodland Park. And in a sense, it was actually the first theme park in Florida. Woodland Park was built by Victor Schmelz and his son. Initially, Schmelz had a large shell mound there that he was digging shell from to pave roads in the area because they didn't have asphalt in those days. Well, after he dug all of this shell from the mound, he was left with a great big hole in the ground. Well, what good is a big hole in the ground after you use the shell up? I mean, you can't do nothing with it. So he said, why not turn it into a swimming pool? And so he, he sank a pipe there for a well, and he, he made a swimming pool. He eventually put concrete around it. He built bathhouses. He kept expanding it. They had a uh, toboggan slide there. They had a pavilion in which they, they had dances. And Woodland Park eventually became a major attraction for Central Florida. On the weekends, it would be filled with as many as 2,000 people. Uh, organizations would have their annual picnics there. It was truly the, the first 
the, the first type of attraction that would be as close as to one of today's theme parks. It closed down in 1912, and, and the, the ruins of it remained there in the, the woods for many, many years and until that swampy area was opened up for the building of the Central Florida Zoo. So as you go into the entrance of the Central Florida Zoo, if you just keep in mind it's to the right there in those woods is where Woodland Park used to be at. I've got to tell you the story of Harry Wise. You know, in the 1960s, he was known by every child in Florida on television as Mr. Magic. But uh, previous to that, Harry Wise was a ghost master. Now you might ask, what is a ghost master? Well, in the old days, all theaters had a stage. And this began back in the vaudeville days. But on occasion, they would put together a live horror show with monsters and magic on stage, quite frightening. And of course, on Halloween, that was a popular show. And Harry was one of the ghost masters that produced these shows, in which he also appeared in. And Harry was the last of America's ghost masters because he carried his show on the road until the 1970s. But Harry was also known by other names. He was known as the Great Vogler. For a couple of years, he performed as a mentalist in clubs throughout the country, mind reading. But he, his heart was really in magic and illusions. And he ran a two hour magic show, which he carried across the country, he even went into Canada. There's hardly a, an old theater that Harry Wise hasn't played in. He spent 50 years in the entertainment business and was truly the greatest entertainer to have emerged out of Central Florida. After World War II, we went into a period of history in, in Sanford and Seminole County that where there was nothing really exciting going on. It, it was kind of like we went into a state of hibernation for a while. The, the celery farming had moved south to Okeechobee. The Navy base had shut down. And it was like Sanford was trying to find itself. As a matter of fact, the same thing occurred with the uh, communities surrounding Sanford, uh, like Longwood or Oveda. Nothing really great was going on then. We did have baseball that moved into Sanford. Be Sanford became a, uh, a winter training camp for the uh, New York Giants. And for a time there, we were known as a baseball training area. But that in itself was not really a, a, a big thing, uh, not compared with what had gone on in the area many years before. It was as if all of Seminole County was kind of waiting for something to happen. And, and it did happen. One thing is that during the Vietnam War, the Navy base opened back up again. So here we had the military economy that was brought back into the area. And the other thing was the coming of, uh, of Disney World. As a matter of fact, there was some thoughts at one time that Disney World would be built in Seminole County. And whether or not that was some sort of a diversion to keep people from really knowing where the location was truly at, I don't know. You know, we've always guessed about that. But uh, real estate prices started going up. And as you can tell, if you've lived around here, things have really changed since then. Sanford now has evolved into a quaint, town where there's a lot of antique shops. There's, there's history to be seen. It's a beautiful little area. And all of this, the way you see Sanford today, is somehow connected to all of that other history many years ago, going all the way back to when Henry Sanford came in and started the town 
through the entertainment history. The Helen Stairs Theater is still standing. That, that was the Rich Theater. And before that, it was Mullane Theater across the street. The old Opera House is still there. So you still see this, this, these historical places. And they've done a wonderful job at putting little historical plaques on the side of the buildings for you to read. Walk around Sanford and you can read all about the history. A lot of the buildings downtown are pretty much the way they looked many years ago. So we're fortunate to have preserved a lot of that. I hope you enjoyed this little bit of history about Seminole County and Sanford. You know, to tell this history in detail would take many, many hours. But there is a way that you can learn a lot more about the local history of the area, and that is by visiting the Museum of Seminole County History on 1792 south of Sanford or the Sanford City Museum on East 1st Street. So until next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>